everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. We're very grateful to have Rebecca Lawrence here with us, speaking in the second installment of the annual women's lecture series at New College. Rebecca read PPE here, here um, matriculating in 1989, and she's had a very impressive public sector career since, now the Chief Executive Officer of the Crown Prosecution Service. So thank you for your time this evening, Rebecca, and I'm sure she'll tell you a lot more about this than I come. Um, so over to you. Well, thank you. It's an absolute joy, a real joy, and a privilege to be here in this beautiful place uh, with wonderful people, um, either those I know, I can see some people I know, uh, but I know it's pretty safe to assume that the rest of you are wonderful. You certainly, you certainly look like you are. Um, now, there's a rather grand title to this talk. Um, I will disappoint some of you. I'm not going to be pontificating on the latest thinking of models of leadership and how those have changed over time. Uh, I actually ran that very question through chat GPT the other day. <laughs> and I have to say, it gives at what first blush is a pretty scarily sort of solid reply. Um, but I know it actually wouldn't survive a new college tutorial or be very interesting to you. But if you are, you can just run it through your phone and compare and contrast as we go. <laughs> Um, instead, I thought what I would do is just tell you a bit about myself, not because I think that's particularly scintillating, but by hearing, you know, how I got here, what I've done since, the choices I've made. I tend to find when I'm in talks like this that hearing about that from other people um, always stimulates a bit of thinking for myself. So that's what I offer you. I offer you some words on how I think of leadership or have come to think of it over the very significant changes in public life over my time as a public servant, what being a woman and what being at New College has given me, what life lessons I've learned so far and what support I've had, and I leave you to take from that whatever makes sense for you or what doesn't. So what was my story up to the point when I came here for interview aged 17 in 1987, I had the, my first view of that magnificent statue by Epstein and first laid eyes on this glorious chapel. Um, what happened before then? So I'm a Londoner, born and raised. I'm the youngest of three. Um, our father worked at Shell International, selling petrochemicals to detergent companies. And he studied chemistry at Cambridge. So visiting quads and cloisters wasn't totally alien to me. And his father, a totally formidable Scot, I wished I'd met him and heard his accent, he was a very gifted and celebrated diabetes doctor for many, de many decades and a pioneer in the use of insulin and patient-led care. So our mother, who I think is watching, hello. Um, our mother is an absolutely inspirational, retired primary school teach head teacher, and she was my teacher too when I was nine. Um, she was raised by absolutely lovely parents on the south coast who didn't expect her to go to university. So she took her tertiary education into her own hands and she did her degree with three children under five, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, and she then raised us on her own, keeping close to our father. I went to the fabulous, really mixed inner, inner London State Primary School um, where she taught and I was really fortunate to be really happy at my secondary school. And I grew up in a really eclectic um, community, not far from here, down the way in Shepherd's Bush in West London, where I still live now, um, with my husband and where we've raised our two sons. And we were surrounded in the 70s and 80s in London by lovely friends and neighbours. And in hindsight, I see that my career choice was influenced by one, um, Pat Mayhew, a civil servant and criminologist, and she was the founder of the British Crime Survey. And she seemed to have the most interesting job of anyone I knew. Um, I remember being a teenager sitting in the kitchen. There was a memo stuck to her fridge, embossed with the heading paper of the office of the Home Secretary, Michael Howard. And it said, uh, the Home Secretary thanks Mrs. Mayhew for her submission. And based on its comprehensive analysis, he will no longer be pursuing the policy of reintroducing the death sentence for police killers. I just thought that was a pretty cool thing to have on your fridge. Um, 
So we had a busy household in and out of different neighbours' houses, and imbued by our mum's really energetic leadership of schools, um, which cemented into her pupils and into and to me a complete love of learning, of chess, of singing, of culture, of hiking in the Cotswolds, which I really used to complain about, but now absolutely love. Um, and we'd be stuck in traffic, going and toing and froing from primary school, listening to the Today programme and PM. And the result of all of this is I actually felt, for some reason, really driven by work and um, the security and purpose that that can bring. Um, so at secondary school, there was a dad who came to speak at a career talk at my school, and he said investment banking was the highest paid job you could get. And that sounded pretty good to me when I was about 18. So before coming here, I had a year off, and somehow I ended up working in an investment bank in the corporate finance department in the late 80s in the takeover boom. I, I cold called my way after getting a phone number of somebody into an extraordinary job. I mean, it was an amazing experience. Um, some of the stories are definitely for later, over dinner or drinks. Um, gave me quite a lot of money then to go traveling afterwards. Um, but also, I think with hindsight, what it gave me is I realized that the thrill of closing a deal or chasing the cash or I could see it really work for some people, but it, it didn't really work for me. Um, so then I came here to New College. Uh, my time doing PPE in itself was politically momentous. Uh, there was the fall of Thatcher. That was announced uh, about 11.15 in the middle of a politics lecture in schools. I'll never forget that moment. In my first term here, we had the fall of the Berlin Wall. and. Um, uh, some second years, I think you'll remember this, uh, drove overnight and then they came back a few days later with chunks of wall, which was, you know, pretty impressive. Um, and not to be outdone, a group of us um, first years, then in the Christmas holidays, um, took ourselves off to Prague. It was three weeks after the revolution and we saw in the new year 1990 there, we saw Havel's inauguration, we saw people coming back to Prague who had, hadn't been there um, for, for decades. Um, saw in the New Year dancing with Russian soldiers. I'm afraid it was another 30 years before I could touch vodka again. Sorry, Mother, if you're listening. Um, uh, but it was a great time at New College. Uh, I lived in, I was in Staircase 10, then in a shared set in um, Savile House in Walton Street in the third year. Went to lots of lectures and seminars, helped produce shows, worked fairly hard, um, but uh, really loved delving into the subjects and um, uh, had plenty of time left for fun, which I hope you do too. Um, and then plunged straight into the world of work, as I said to you that I would. Um, I took a summer job and then it became a whole year's job at Oxera, the economic think tank, headed by Dieter Helm and Colin Mayer, which was wonderful. A year in Harvard. Uh, gave me lots of lots of choices. I flirted potentially with going back to banking um, or to becoming an academic, looking at public administration, doing a PhD in political science. Um, but in the end, I took the civil service fast stream. I was thinking of that memo on the fridge um, and um, went to the treasury. I thought maybe I'd stay for just three or four years and then go to the city, but I didn't. I stayed 16 years and then more in the public sector. Um, now, why? why? Why did I do that? Um, well, I mean, it was just brilliant, brilliant policy work and subjects of amazing political interest to a PPEist, you know, working right at the heart of the issues that were top or second on the Today program that morning. Um, the major government, the European Fast Stream, it was really exciting. I went to the European Commission, to the office of the French commissioner on the run-up to the first, who, who was joining the first wave of the Euro. Worked with some wonderful new college people along the way. Thank you, Jonathan Taylor, um, on the European work, health policy. I worked on the first budget in which Labour could take the brakes off the former Tory spending plans, spent 3% of GDP on the NHS over a four-year period. It was amazing. Thank you, Andrew Hudson. Worked on climate change policy the first Climate Change Act, energy transformation. There's a lot we could talk about on that later. Crisis management on foot and mouth and floods. The heart of decision making, in and out of number 10. Massive privilege. Um, 
But I tend to find, um, what I've found from all my civil service friends, there's some who really love being in the centre, the nexus of that, and others that being out on the coalface, sort of closer to delivery, speaks to them. And I'm certainly in that latter camp. So um, let out of the Treasury with my then job share partner to work on counter-terrorism. It was after 9-11 in the run-up to the Olympics. Um, uh, right in crisis management again. An amazing secondment then into policing and criminal justice, into um, counter-terrorist policing, keeping London safe for the Olympics. And then, rather than go back to Whitehall, it was post-Olympics London. Uh, Boris Johnson was mayor. Um, the mayor had just been given responsibilities for new responsibilities for overseeing policing and holding the budget of the Met. And that sounded quite exciting. So I went to work um, for Boris um, Johnson in the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime, and then for Sadiq Khan as his, his chief exec in an era of massive rise in youth violence, sadly successful terrorist attacks, the Grenfell fire, um, an extraordinary job and a real privilege, um, and set me up very well um, then when the role became available and I was asked to apply to be um, chief exec of the Crown Prosecution Service. So the Director of Public Prosecutions is the legal head, but the Chief Exec holds the budget, sets the strategy, runs the IT transformation, culture, resourcing, um, and it's been an extraordinary time. I led it through COVID six months in. I didn't know my crisis management skills would all <laughs> come back into play, um, and the organization did magnificently, managing the pressures, and then huge work that some of you will be familiar about reversing the decline in rape prosecutions. So that's a whistle-stop tour of what I've done. There have been many a difficult moment, um, never a dull moment, um, and nothing that I regret. Um, but what does that mean about leadership, and how do we think of that? And um, what are the principles that guide me, and what, how do I think of leadership in that context? So over the time of my working life, um, and any of you who study politics, you will be studying this now. Um, there's obviously been a massive shift in the way politics has been conducted. The relationships between ministers and civil servants have gone through many different phases and changes. Engagement, expectations of the public, polarization of attitudes, all of that is well documented. Um, you can ask me later about the impact of that on any policy questions, um, uh, and I've worked through a number of them. But in terms of leadership, I found myself thinking about the principles of public life, the Nolan principles, which some of you will have heard of, uh, because those are the principles that, as a public servant, when you take on a role, um, you have to use to guide you. Um, and a phrase in, in politics as standards in public life has been, um, uh, this has been obviously a very topical discussion. Um, but it was very topical for me when I joined the civil service as well. And that was the last phase in which that was really, really dominant when the Committee on Standards in Public Life was set up. And as many of you will know, Lord Nolan, um, a law lord and former Court of Appeal judge, was tasked by John Major after a series of sleaze candles. This is what sleaze was in those days, um, extramarital affairs, um, cash for questions, or, and there were bribes for weapon sales to the company Matrix Churchill. So he, um, he wrote his, his famous report of the principles of standard in public life, and leadership is the final one of those standards, namely that holders of public office should exhibit all of the previous principles in their behavior and treat others with respect, and should actively support and promote the principles. And um, the current chair of um, the committee, Jonathan Evans, whom I have huge respect, in his latest report, um, as part of a response to some failures in standards in recent years, um, said that we should all, as public service leaders, ask ourselves how we can personally demonstrate and encourage others to live up to the principles. So I thought I might just talk about the principles I feel duty-bound to. Um, but it's also because they are quite timeless principles, and I think they serve really well as sort of guidelines or perhaps even guardrails in life, in the sort of life situations in which we all face ourselves and, and will. I'm not going to test you um, at the end, um, but uh, see if you can remember them. But it is, I found it is quite a good test of ourselves to see 
what reflections we have on them. So principle number one is selflessness. Of holders of public office should act solely in terms of the public interest. Um, now, certainly um, in the leadership model we have in, in, in Britain, um, I, I think it can work really well and does work really well with politically neutral civil servants building a trusted relationship with ministers to advise on them and implement them on the policies of a demo democratically elected government of the day and putting public interest first um, in their advice. And, you know, I've seen that so much in, in, in the working world um, with the, the policy advice at the centre. That, that is a key principle of all those years I worked in central government. Uh, but what I love when you're in the front line is you see it day in, day out in the leadership of the front line in increasingly challenging circumstances, be it your courts officers, probation officers, police, the community youth workers I've seen, health staff, flood engineers, climate scientists. You know, the innovation and determination of leaders at all level that I've had the privilege to work with is just brilliant. And, really inspiring partnerships from local government and the expertise of support functions, um, finance, IT, behavioral analysis. Um, there's selflessness there in buckets um, and it's really inspiring. Uh, and when any of us see culture or practice that is poor and sadly or, or outrageous and sadly, of course there are um, examples and tragic tales of that. It is an affront to us all and you, I see leaders motivated all the more um, to um, drive change and make improvement. Um, but what, what actually is behind all of that? Well, yes, you can take courses in it, in building teams, in setting the vision, in developing selfless leadership. Um, if you back to chat, see um, GCT, apparently I am in the model of servant leader. That's nice to know. Um, but I, I tend to find it boils down to simply um, being selfless in a kind of pretty everyday way, bringing people on, using emotional intelligence as much as intellectual or technical expertise, not thinking about one's status, and treating others as you'd wish to be treated. And personally um, speaking, I think New College has that in bucket loads too. I found when I got here, I found there was never pressure for the college to have a certain place in the Norrington table. I didn't feel there was an expectation it was grooming a pipeline of prime ministers and I needed to be on some pipeline that I had to fit or further the interests of the college. I felt the college was there as sort of selfless and really timeless support with, with respect. Manners maketh man. Um, I approached my, my philosophy tutor, Jonathan Glover, and in later years I asked him if he'd wanted to do some work on counter-terrorist ethics. No, he didn't want to do that. He wrote back really nicely. He said, what I'd love to do is have Sunday lunch and meet your family. So we had Sunday lunch with his wife, and he talked to my nine-year-old son um, about driverless cars and how the trolley problem applied to that. And, you know, there was a wonderful teacher who'd been always interested in young people. Or Martin Keedle with his interest in my politics thesis. I, I still have a letter from him on whether I was coping in the run-up to finals. I actually wasn't, but I didn't know it. Um, so I can see all the selfless support offered. So my advice to those of you who are here is look out for that support and take it. So principle number two um, is integrity. Holders of public office can't place themselves under obligation to people or organizations who might influence them. They can't take decisions for material benefits for themselves, and they've got to declare and resolve any conflicts of interest, i.e. no bribery, no personal gain. Now, on the whole, the process for, for avoiding this, the checks and balances um, are drummed into you, certainly in the Treasury and as an accounting officer in the budget, there's well-trodden um, um, processes and, ex and processes for examining potential breaches, um, including by ministers, and you will be aware of the structures around that, which I won't go into. Um, what I've seen is you tend to be pretty safe with civil servants. We don't really, we're not the type to take a bribe. I get quite excited when there's custard creams at a meeting for free. <laughs> um, you know, travel second class. If there's those biscuits wrapped in gold paper with chocolate on, you know, that's pretty special. Um, so it, it's, it, we're just not the type. But I have once, I have to say, um, 
bribed a public official, and that was when I was living in Belgium. Uh, and there was a, I was living in, it was, it was shocking to have to do this, but it was the system. I was my, it was my secondment to the European Commission was coming to an end. Um, lived in a one-way street, you could only park on one side. But I asked my landlady, what do I do to get the removals van in? And she said, well, although it's a no-parking street, you just go to the police station, you give them, it was the equivalent of about 30 quid, and they'll block it off and your removals van can go. Well, I was so naive because my family upbringing and New College did not teach me how to bribe a public official. So I just turned up at the police station and I said, I've come with my 30 pounds for you to block off the road. <laughs> <laughs> and this police officer just looked at me and went, but madame, this is all in French, madame, you know, this is a one-way street. It is not legal to park there. And I thought, well, what do I do now? So I kind of imagined I was in a movie and what would I do now? Okay, so I recut, left the note on the table, and just in my best French said, oh, you know, monsieur, I've had such a lovely time living in Belgium, a wonderful country, but now I am so lost and helpless, I do not know what to do. Can you help me with this situation? And he said, would it help if I sent round? I said, yes. And I walked out just leaving the money there. Now, it's depressing. It made me, it, it made me feel, on the one hand, really proud to be in a country which has very low levels of corruption on the OECD um, uh, index. Um, but it was also very poignant because at that time in Belgium, there was um, a terrible time where there were huge protests and demonstrations, 300,000 citizens taking to the street at the mishandling of um, the case of Marc de Troux, who was a serial killer and abductor of young children. And many Belgians felt that he was part of a network which included high-ranking members of government and was part of a cor deep corruption in the state that they felt was connected to the lower level corruption um, that, uh, that they experienced. And he had held two young girls who sadly then died, um, captured in his basement for, um, uh, for horrible, um, unspeakable aims. Uh, so, so Belgium was really suffering from lack of integrity. And I was really impressed that people were protesting. Incidentally, what I would say is there were other things that were very good. So the press in coverage of that story um, did not speculate on what had happened to the girls, did not doorstep their families, and there was no intrusion into their grief, and I have to ask if that would happen here. Um, objectivity, principle three. You've got to take decisions impartially, fairly, using the best evidence and without discrimination or bias. Now, this is where New College comes into its own, I think. Um, so, in terms of best evidence, I found the backdrop of the quality of education meant I could smash it in becoming expert in different subject fields, reading, reading deep into them, confidence to present to ministers, to select committees, to write submissions. That came from the learning here. Came from a different tutorial style. Me and, me and Tom Weeks, as, as philosophers, would each read the reading list, go in really competitive and thrash it out. We, we still do. He is, he is godfather to our eldest child, and he's taught our son's advocacy. Uh, and and in, early in my career, that's kind of what I needed to do a lot of. With Jake, we took a different approach. I always thought it was slightly naughty, but I actually realized it was really effective. We used to take it in turns to read the reading list, so one could have a slightly lighter week. <laughs> one would read it, and then I'd go around, and, and the other would brief them, and then we would wing it together. Um, <laughs> I used to think that was really dodgy, but now, of course, that's what I do day in, day out. I take a brief from the, ex the subject matter experts, I test it with them, and it's just very time efficient. Um, but the other aspect of that objectivity without um, discrimination or bias, I really found New College uh, had that in spades. So women had only been here 10 years when I started. But when I came here, it just felt fully co-ed. Um, there was a sort of radicalism in the curriculum, the wonderful Liz Fraser, my political theory tutor. It was imbued with the feminist theory of the 80s. It could run through me and it felt totally normal. And there was a genuine respect for difference. Um, the 10 year celebrations were so affirming. It meant that when I arrived up in the treasury, there was a sort of, you could sign up to give a tax seminar. Um, I thought, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll pick the topic of women in the tax system. Is there any bias? Um, and I looked at VAT on tampons, the distribution of budget measures by sex, bias that might be gender bias that might be inherent in decision making. This felt totally normal to me. I had no idea it was completely not normal for the treasury culture at the time. But some very good women sat at the front row and encouraged me. 
Um, and I think that has really helped me take that approach in all my subsequent work and, and to challenge discrimination and to support those many others who've done that for the whole of their career. Um, and it you know, gives me great pleasure in the, in the CPS to support to the work of our brilliant National Black Crown Prosecutors Association, um, set up after Sylvia Denman just only a little over 20 years ago found um, institutional racism in the CPS, as McPherson had done with the Met. And it's, honored, it's been an honor to be a sort of leadership steward of that work. Okay, I'll put my skates on. Principle four is accountability. Holders of public office have got to be accountable for their decisions and must submit themselves to scrutiny. Uh, this is about rule breaking, really. Um, well, there's accounting for public money, uh, which I'm very steeped in. Um, but really, as in life, it's accounting for your actions. Have you, um, can you know, all stand up to scrutiny? Have you played by the rules? So I'm going to be open with you. As a youngster, I did not always follow the rules. I broke some in my youth and college, a normal university experience, and most of them I absolutely don't regret, as long as you're not doing any harm to anyone. Getting a viewpoint to watch the sunrise through the spires. I may have slipped into a college ball or two without a ticket. I might have crossed the wobbly Millennium Bridge when it was shut with my lawyer new college friend telling me it was only trespass and they didn't mind. Um, <laughs> but the more senior I get, the less I do. In the fine phrase of the wonderful Ghanaian late mother of a colleague of mine, she says, the higher the monkey climb the tree, the tidier it's behind must be. <laughs> and that is so true. And in COVID, uh, we all had to be careful, um, had to be, um, scrupulously careful. We did huge contortions of family life, huge contortions of a holiday in Scotland where we got COVID, landed and abandoned up there with a tiny hire car and driving it down. It was all very complicated and difficult as it was for any people, but I, um, it was the right thing to do to follow all those rules um, and the right thing to do for society. Um, and given the public and personal consequences of not doing so, I have to say the view from the moral high ground is rather safe and sound. Um, the next principle, openness. Always act in an open and transparent manner um, and don't withhold information from the public. Had to do this so much. Um, can you really, will you be able to show that the decisions you took, you took in the right way? Um, on counterterrorism, that's imbued through you. Um, there's, there's openness in how you present to the public, but for me, the really hard and most important thing is openness when you're with and listening to communities. So I think of being in a community centre in Camberwell that had seen two knife murders um, of young people, by young people, in swift succession, uh, and, and it's horrific. And what's important is not to hide, but to show up to explain alongside local authority and police what City Hall and the police are doing, what we can be open about, what we can't, in the most raw of circumstances. And that is a principle that always guides me. Principle six is honesty. I'm sure you are all honest and truthful um, uh, and never lie. Um, uh, it's really interesting if any of you have heard Jonathan Aitken um, speak, he kindly, um, he was obviously the former minister who sued the Guardian for libel, but then himself was convicted of perjury. And hearing him speak of his conversion to faith and his reflections on honesty and then of justice are really powerful. And actually he gave the first sermon to our first ever um, CPS online carol service uh, with a virtual choir, which was really fun to be part of. Um, so honesty really is the best policy. But I think with honesty, there's always that piece. It's, it's not just what you actually say is true, but there's the wider context true as well. And uh, whenever our boys squabble, Jacob hit me, Sam's being mean, the killer question we would always ask is, yes, and what happened just before that? <laughs> um, so leadership is, um, is, according to Nolan, practicing all of those. Um, I can't profess to always be perfect, but I do actually use these principles together as, as, as guardrails, and I think if you do, they do serve you well. So finally, I'm left with just two questions. Of what role has being a woman played um, for me in my life? This is the women's leadership lecture, after all. And what are my sources of support, including New College? 
well, I feel really lucky that I was able to move pretty seamlessly from being a young girl who loved learning into a young woman um, and through um, the role that this place played in that. And I'm really grateful to all the women who came before in society as a whole and fought for rights and fought against discrimination. I was really lucky to have really good experiences, pregnancy, childbirth, and that the Treasury was really pioneering in making life stack up for working parents. I worked part-time and in job shares for 13 years and got to spend all the time I wanted with our boys. Um, I've been really grateful for professional support um, throughout my time. I have Helen King here, um, who's the principal at St. Anne's and was assistant commissioner at the Met when I was at City Hall. We supported each other in a lot of really interesting and important um, management of politicians and investment and contracts and changing in policing. Uh, I have brilliant personal support. Um, I was set up with a chief constable mentor 10 years ago when giving dementia care to our father. Um, and then some Helen Ghosh from Balliol gave brilliant personal and professional support combined um, when my children were young and she was permanent secretary of DEFRA and then home office. Um, it's not all been easy. Uh, effect of menopause, surgery and COVID, I could do another talk on that. They gave my body and brain a brief, brief run for their money. Um, but I suppose it's quite good to be on trend. And uh, I had the support of lots and lots of friends through that time, including people from New College, who, to whom I'm very thankful. But one of the joys of leadership has been the platform to support others. So I've received support. I can mentor others who've had experiences similar to mine. But the real privilege of leadership is being able to give a platform to support those on issues I haven't experienced or don't, um, don't have issues of intersectionality, issues relating to physicality, maybe endometriosis, gender-based violence, of course, miscarriage, baby loss, um, uh, or many, many dis disability, the list goes on. And I really, I love being able to give platforms to the very selfless people who step forward in our organizations and more widely to give support to others um, to enable the environment that they can manage with this. Uh, but the most important support you have is um, your choice of, of life partner, if you're lucky enough to be in that position. So Eleanor Roosevelt said, a woman's like a tea bag. You can't tell how strong she is till you put her in hot water. Well, I know I can take boiling, and I often have, but you can't do it alone, and it needs someone to put the kettle on to give you joy and companionship. So sorry for a big cheesy moment, but the most selfless man I know is in the room there, and that's um, Hugo Jolliffe. And for all those, um, he's always loved and supported my public sector career. It makes home life, social life, and intellectual life a complete joy. So for all those cups of tea, Hugo, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and then finally, as well as the support of people, there's the joy of being in a beautiful place and the joy of having fun. And there's no finer model than New College. I've always loved this place. Its surroundings are so anchoring. It's so peaceful. Um, there's a timeless permanency which is so grounding in the cloisters, the garden, um, the Epstein sculpture, uh, the steps of the mound. Um, the future is... The, the, the future is incorporated into this place with its past, with ease, the sculpture, the steps, the new quad. I, I loved reading that the, um, uh, the new college school uh, describing how they loved watching how you can build something quite so substantial, so innovative and so wavy. Um, and that will mean being able to live in in your final year, I think, will be brilliant. So this place has constant and groundbreaking scholarship. Um, constant stewardship of the beautiful, beautiful environment. And that doesn't happen by chance. That takes leadership and really skilled stewardship to sustain that, um, to sustain all those intellectual, physical, cultural, and spiritual treasures. So thank you, New College, and thank you, Miles, and your team for all you do. Um, but also, it's not all about work. New College is all about fun as well, and fun is so important to life. Um, the final party I went to before lockdown was 40 years of women at New College. I had that brilliant band playing, great dancing, fabulous conversation, huge 
joy. I think you led from the front on the dance floor, I seem to recall. And uh, I, felt like, I felt like I was back at a college bop. And you can't say those words to many people outside of this place without it sounding a little bit odd. Um, and I seem to remember it even had my favorite 1970s disco and funk, because I'm afraid I can do Nolan Sisters just pretty much as well as I can do Nolan Principles. Um, so what, what I would say to you all is, I'm sure you're all wonderful and you know how to make good choices for yourself um, and to give yourself some, um, some guardrails. Um, I just encourage you to stay connected to what you have here as it's really precious and really timeless and can help see you through. And if you can be confident in your decision making that you're doing the right thing, you're likely to do all right. So thank you. I think everyone can agree that that has a really lovely and inspirational talk. And luckily, we have a few minutes for maybe a couple of questions. Uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, you could come down to this microphone at the front if you're happy to. Yeah, I'm very happy to take yeah. questions. Yes, go on. Yeah, sure. What was the biggest setback of your career and how did those things sort of impact how you do things? Uh, could you repeat it for the live stream? Uh, so biggest setback of biggest setback of my career and how the principles helped. Um, well actually I think there's lots of little setbacks and then they help you when the bigger obvious ones come along. The bigger obvious ones are sort of health. Uh, but the little setbacks I think there are ones about jobs you didn't get. I've given you the CV of the jobs I got. There's plenty I didn't get. Um, there's plenty I didn't get. Uh, working, uh, being a, a principal private secretary, no, private secretary economic to Blair, uh, big job on climate change, other jobs that you don't get. And every time I don't get something, I think now what was really behind that? And I think there's always something about authenticity the things I haven't got, I was either not confident about because I didn't have the technical skills, and it's not usually the case, or more confident because I wasn't sure if the fit was right. Was I trying to be someone that I wasn't? Mm -hmm. So I think being authentic and coming back to those principles, what's the selfless thing, what's the right thing for myself, you know, is this really who I am, is what I'm, I'm about, those are the things that get you through. And then it's the people and the support that, that get you through. They, they pick you up every time you've had a little knockback. But you do, you just get lots of knockbacks. <laughs> but that's what I would say. Yeah, sure. Hi, so it's a really interesting kind of your career path there, mm -hmm. and to where you are now. Um, it can be easy to see how kind of the politics help with the uh, system service and Yeah, yeah, okay, really interesting. So, um, a, a little secret, I wasn't very good at economics and I gave it up at the end of the first year. I remember, uh, <laughs> I remember in my interview being asked how interest rate works and then I, I, I never really <laughs> was never really very secure on it. So I'm not an economist. Um, and actually I found in the treasury working, being trained in economics and economics for policy makers was really good. So um, workplace training can be excellent. Um, the politics, as you say, is there's the obvious fit. But the philosophy actually was really important um, in two ways. There's one is I actually found the structure of logic. I love, do you study philosophy? Or? Uh, yeah, I love logic and you've got a great logic tutor here. And actually that framework for um, structuring submissions or thinking where arguments fall away or thinking in a polarized political debate, what's the points of alignment and what, what's the points of divergence and where they come up in an argument. I found that a very helpful in intellectual framework. But I really, what I loved about coming out of the treasury and working in social policy and working in crime and working in communities is where the philosophy comes in because it's where ethics comes in and it, it yeah, so, and, 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 and moral choices 
and moral trade-offs and seeing individuals and communities not as um, rational individuals that can be modelled economically but complex individuals with their range of different needs and that fuzzy area of philosophy I found was gave me the sort of clarity that was really helpful or help you understand why it's okay for those questions to feel so difficult. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, stick with philosophy, it's great. Um, there was another question in there. Yeah, hello. Hi, um, so my name's Caroline Wooder. We worked together many years ago. Yes. Like, yes. Oh yes, um, nice to see you. You were, um, you were a part of the job share then. Um, yeah. I now am part of the job share um, in Trinity Job Service. Um, and I, you really blamed the players, and it was quite unusual at the time, but it's a much more common now, so firstly, thank you for that. But I wondered if you had any more to say about alternative ways of working yeah. in your career. It's not something I thought about when I was an undergraduate and sort of families and all of that in the way of Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, sure. It's lovely to see you again. It's really nice. Um, absolutely. I think, I think there's so much more that we can do to be really innovative and really creative. And I think you can design pretty much any job around the needs of people and find other people who can combine. And I think that's a much better way of thinking about how um, to fulfill work. So rather than what does the work need and find a person to match, it's what will help people thrive and structure the work to match. I think you can be really innovative um, in that. And I think that job shares don't have to be on a similar simple model of, well, we did three days and three days with six between us with an overlap day. You can combine all kinds of flexi partnerships. Um, and um, I did have a brilliant um, job share with Siobhan Peters. And what made that brilliant is that we contracted with each other about what we were really open and honest about what were our drivers, what were our motivators, what are our derailers, what are the things that you know, give us setbacks, back to your question, and different, we would have different triggers and, and setbacks. And we, had, we were aligned on strategy, relied on our philosophy of leadership, and it was, it was really good, and we job shared in the Treasury and then in counter-terrorism, and then we came back later. So when I was chief exec at City Hall, she had become a CFO by then. She was a deputy CFO in, in the health sector. Um, and then she came to Mopac and was my CFO. And we almost had that like a share. The partnership between a chief exec and a chief financial officer has to be, um, it's, it's a line management, but it's a, it's a professional partnership. And it was brilliant doing that again. So I just think, take, People will thrive and work will be done better if there's a real understanding of what the, those individuals' needs are. And I think there can be real radicalism in design of jobs. But this place taught me to be radical, so why not? I think that's probably all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you everyone for coming and everyone watching on the live stream as well. But I think the biggest thank you has to go to Rebecca for her time tonight and for giving such an inspiring and fascinating talk. So. Thank you, Rebecca.